Now we want to change focus to residential real estate. It's interesting when you hear and people say that um, there's an increase in the demand for studio apartments and one bedroom apartments. This is quite a social shift, I think, you know, because we're very family oriented in Nigeria. And I do wonder what's driving it. So this discussion is on the increasing and changing development pipeline in the residential sector with an uncharacteristically high proportion of units dedicated to studios and one bedroom units. So what do we want to know? We are asking what's driving this development and to what extent has this demand been validated? Well, our parents were into so much farming they acquire so much expanse of land, uh, size of land, with a lot of rooms. But in this, these days, it has changed. The, 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 the <laughs> millennium children okay, so do not, not they are not so much into agriculture. They are not even into agriculture. And so they have moved into technology, and the need for smaller size apartments is what is driving all this. So I, I, I will tell you in a nutshell that it is... Uh, it's, it, it's a demand pool trend. It's clear, it's, I mean, thank you for that. Because I, I cast my mind back to very many years ago when I used to be um, a broker. You know, you, you had people come into the market, some of them experts, you know, some relocating, or just wanted a better life. And they said, look, I want these amenities, I want the services. And the only thing you had to offer them were three bedrooms. So down the line, you find out they lock two rooms up, use one. You know, and the house is barely in use, but they wanted that thing, just that quality of service, because their only option to get the small room was to get someone's chalet or someone's um, um, boys' quarters. But clearly, the developers have responded to the demand you've mentioned. So, GS, I would, um, you've, you've developed across the board. You've developed mid-scale, you develop high-end. How, what's, what's your take on this, imagine trend of the one bed. How have you taken it on board? What has it changed for you? What's, what's driving it? Just, just give us your view. Thank you. Um, I think um, as a developer, I would say everyone knows we develop to the market. You don't just build. You know, we research the market and what we put in the market is what the market demands. Now, this phenomenon is market-driven. Um, and that's because, like Chas said, we have an emerging middle market. You know, we have about 33 million young people in Nigeria between the age of 18 and 35. And of this, it's a, a good proportion of them are professionals who are gainfully employed. These people, they are a game changer because it's the millennium millennium phenomenon that is changing the world. Nigeria is not an exception. You have to respond to that as a developer. So that's, that's one factor. Second factor is affordability. Because these are young people, they are not able to afford you know, what the average person, professional, who are older than them are able to afford. So affordability is also a factor that has created this demand. Thirdly, you have people who are not necessarily in the millennium group, but they are in the city where there is a shortage of infrastructure. I, I give you an example. In Lagos, for instance, people are working in the, in, the, in the CBD area, but they leave their families in the suburb. Now, um, the suburb is more serene and is more affordable for large group. But because they're in Lagos, you don't have good transport system. If they had a train that would take them from workplace to home, then they wouldn't want to live in a smaller apartment. I've had you know, a professional person who is not in that group, not a millennium group, but you know, is, is an executive in, in an oil and gas company, and, and he's, uh, he's requesting for a one-bedroom. He wants a one-bedroom accommodation. I said, this is not for you. He said, it's for me. You know, and it's because I need it from Monday to Friday. On, 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 on Saturday or Friday evening, I go home. On Saturday, I, on Sunday night, I come back. On Monday morning, I come back. You know, so there's this, there's this factor as well. 
Now, a city has to be resilient. We are an ecosystem, you know, and whatever um, one section does, it affects all other sections. So as developers, you have to find a way to bring the interplay of all these forces into what you bring to the market. So that's, you know, that's a key driver. You know. There's another one that you look at people who are retiring. Um, in those days, our parents, maybe I'm getting to that age now where I will be thinking of retiring, you know, but you see that in, in the times past, we retire into very large homes, four or five bedroom homes. And our children are grown up, they are married, most of them are abroad, you know, and you are, you are left with your wife in this massive house. Now, if you love the city, you don't want to retire to the, to the, to the rural community where you can't fit in, you'll find that you, you, you are no longer earning and you have to maintain this highly, you know, expensive mansion, you know. So, most people now want to retire into a one-bedroom or two-bedroom apartment. It's no longer surprising. And what do they do? They lease out this, their massive uh, housing, you know, to corporate entities. So that is also an emergent factor. The last factor I'll look at is changing lifestyle. Changing lifestyle in the sense that we as a people, I mean, we had, we, we've had a colonial legacy. You know, most, look at the way we are all dressed here with tie and everything. This is not cultural. You know, so everything that we are putting on here is from the West. You know, can anybody tell me what proportion of their dressing is, is Nigerian? No, I'm, you know, we are an exception. I can say that. <laughs> Yes, you know, so, you know, you find that when I first got to London in, a long time ago, it was, it was like an anticlimax because the houses were so tiny, pokey, you know, and, you know, and I was looking at comparing it what we have in Nigeria, expansive spaces. Mm -hmm. But you find that over time, economics have come in. You know, people have to build to maximize returns. Mm -hmm. So as developers, you have a finite space. You have to maximize your returns from that finance space. And because you're also driven by the market, you're building smaller. So minimalism, sustainability, and all that have come into play. So these are all the key factors that I think, from a developer point of view, you know, is driving the market. Thank you. Thank, thank you very, thank you. very much. It's, I think it's crucial for the for the developers and people that play in that space to, to constantly, you know, feel the pulse of the market and and evolve with it so they're not, so they're not um, left behind. And clearly we see that that happens from time to time. You know, there's a new, there, there, there's a trend on the market, which for example, for, I mean, what we're talking about now is the one bed. So naturally, everybody, like the term they use, everybody's gonna jump on it. And you see people d developing a mix of three, two, one bedrooms and studios. So Priye, I mean, you, you, you have a very, um, you, you sit at a very interesting place, right? And which, which I think is very important in this industry. You've had a development background and you still do part of development and you do facility management and asset management. So it means that you see with um, different lens. I'll still drill down um, on that and how, you know, how that comes together more. But as these developers jump on this new trend, what do you think you know, will be the factors? Because there's going to be a crowd and they will, will require segregation. How are developers and you know, people putting these properties in the market, how are they able to then differentiate? Because the, the former factor was, oh, this guy was doing one bed. This, the guy, this person had only three beds, that was clear. But when we are beginning to offer a mix of that, what are the critical things that we, were, that's gonna be important for, for, I mean, property developers to differentiate themselves? Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, before I, talk about differentiation, I, I also want to add to what um, GS and Charles have said Please concerning the factors driving demand. Um, I think the, um, there's, there was um, a clear supply gap in the market. Um, and by that I mean we, we all know m what most developers brought to the market at the time were mainly the three beds, four beds, um, and at times even five beds. But as time went by, um, two beds started looking a bit more attractive um, because clearly, you know, um, some of the factors they've mentioned um, 
compel developers to start looking at smaller units. So it's um, no surprise that, um, that there's now a huge pipeline for one bed and two beds in the market. Um, while the, um, the, the effectiveness of this demand is still a bit sketchy, um, because um, um, from what we see in um, um, some of the research we've done, um, in terms of the pipeline where you have one bed, two bed, three beds, most of the inquiries that still come, still come for the um, two beds and three beds. Are these are this lease inquiries or are they inquiries to purchase? Yeah, so, so that's the thing. Um, for, for most people and for most developers, um, it's clear that the demand exists, but that demand seems to rest more on the rental market. Okay, um, we've not tested um, fully proven the market for um, the investor. You know, most investors still think about two beds, three beds. But um, so if the investors are going to be there, they might not really actually be the millennials we talk about, the young people, because most of those young people are actually looking for these one beds because they want to rent not necessarily that they want to buy. So you need courageous investors in the market that um, would take that risk, um, um, clearly scope and define the demand. For instance, um, those in the corporate market, um, corporates can, um, because they are the ones that have that need most. They want to create um, um, small apartment for their experts, top execs, uh, people that already have their mansion somewhere, but um, as Gia said, because of transportation difficulty, they cannot get to, to the central business district. So they want to just rent something close to office. So those guys, they need a small one bed. So you might see institutional investors buying these one beds in multiples, you know, but um, that's where I think the market is going. But in terms of um, differentiation, I think a lot will have to do with uh, the sort of amenities that come with these one beds. Um, while some have argued that, look, it's a one bed, um, you really don't need to add all the frills and stuff that um, typically the two or three beds will have. But when you consider, again, the sort of people that want to stay in this apartment, for instance, if you're bringing in an expert, some of these experts will say, oh, I want my driver to be close by, I want my house help to be here. So I, I wonder, um, is it that this one bed will still have the normal BQs that we are very familiar with in um, Nigeria? Um, then you have facility management. That's also key. Um, it's, it's a one bed apartment. Um, I believe because it's close to the CBD, it will be highly priced. So the people living there will be a bit sophisticated. So they want good facility management. Um, and even though it's one, a one bed, it shouldn't be too um, 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 small. Uh, it could be adequately sized. The few I've seen, nice, decent um, living room, um, Decent kitchen, uh, but it's one bed. So it has basically the same size with um, your typical two bed, um, but it's just one bed. So I think for differentiation, you have to pay particular attention to facility management and, um, and adequate sizing. Thank you. Thank you very much. In, I mean, generally speaking, when we're talking about um, this residential units, you've alluded to the fact that there are two... Um, two sides that play in it. The owners who, you know, um, write the check for the investment and the occupiers who end up paying the rent in a residential space. And Charles, your market facing. I, I remember that very many years ago, it was a struggle to get people, some people that were not very sophisticated or had not seen this trend in, 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 in more advanced climbs. It was a struggle to even get people to buy a flat. You know, I spoke to people and they said, so if I buy this flat on the sixth floor, God forbid, if this building gets demolished, what do I own? You know, they're still used to owning a house and owning the land and the compound. But gradually it ticked along and we found out that people were comfortable with the idea of owning 
maybe a three bedroom or a four bedroom, because at the back of their mind, they go, worst case scenario, you know what, I could pop into this place. Some of them will buy it and say, maybe I'll use it down the line. We sort of settle there. Now we're pushing the envelope and we're telling people, the investors um, specifically, write this check, buy this one bedroom apartment. Say for example, buy two or three one bedrooms rather than buying this four bedroom flat and you still get the investment because if you're purchasing an investment, you're buying the cash flow. How has, I, I mean, what's the reception been like? You know, trying to convince people to say, you know, well, step away from what you're used to, buying three, four beds and invest in this smaller one bedroom unit. You will never be able to live in, but I guarantee you there is demand for it. Thank you. <clears throat> I think there's, um, there's huge demand for it. We must understand that there's been a shift, a shift in cultural practices, a shift in occupational practices, and a shift in family size, right? Because we find out that family size have reduced from the government uh, proposed four children to a, a home to now you find people having just one child or two children, right? And so they, don't, they do not need that level of that number of rooms, five bedrooms and six bedrooms as the case may be. They just go for one, two bedroom and all that. So that's where the market is. Because of the shift in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in that uh, trend in the family size, because of the shift in kind of job people do, right? Not uh, uh, in those days. That's why is it, uh, in the 70s and 60s, we used to have GREs. And they occupy very large expanse of land. Now, what is happening in uh, the, G the GREs of Ikoyi? And, uh, and uh, Ikeja, you find that these GROs that occupy the buildings that occupy one acre, two acre plot of land, land they are now being converted to high rise, two bedroom, three bedroom block of flats because the trend is changing. People no longer want to go for that large expanse of land. In this case, we are talking about land use management, proper intensive land use. No longer intensive land use is, I mean, you keep going up, right, to make sure you get the best value for your money. That's the trend, rather than the extensive land use, where you occupy so much uh, vast uh, uh, land and um, for which you're not going to use for anything uh, valuable. So I would say that there is large market for it. It's there. Yeah, and how, how are the potential investors, how are they receiving this? Is it been easy? Has there been pushbacks in people you would ordinarily sell bigger apartments to, trying to convince them to purchase as investments if they're not the end users for the smaller apartment? Has there been a struggle or has that been seamless? I'll say no, there hasn't been a, a struggle. The fact is that there is a short stage in supply. Okay. That's just the point. All right. If they find it, they will go for it. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Jess, from your development, I mean, similar to his, I mean, the, 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 the comments he's made, from a developer's perspective, clearly you're, you are building in response to the demand, but how much um, recalibration have you had to do to sort of get your head around, okay, this is how we need to go, and in practice for you, and I mean from design, from financing, everything, how much has this uh, new trend brought, how much has that put on your table? And how's, how's it influenced your, your modus operandi as it were? Yeah, thank you. I, I think <clears throat> that um, if you look over time, we have gone through a, a hog of um, having products that you put in the market that suits basically what we had in the past, like two bedroom, three bedroom, four bedrooms. You know, you never heard of studio or one-bedroom apartments. But not, like we said earlier, things have changed. And many investors, I, I can tell you, they are aware of the fact that in Nigeria, when you say you are building small or affordable housing or affordable or mixed income or middle income apartments, they know that the, the middle income people that you have intended for it to be 
only a very small proportion of them can afford to buy. That supports what Priye was saying, you know, that largely, you know, there are investors who would come in and buy up this with a view to letting. And that's where the attraction for investment comes in. We have had to do a recalibration in the sense that today, you know, you can have several small units that you can put on Airbnb, for instance. You know, many people didn't know anything about Airbnb before, but you know, you, are, you, are, you can easily see the numbers that it's better for me to do a three one-bedroom apartment and put in Airbnb for investment than a one three-bedroom flat and put in Airbnb because the returns are different. You know, so the recalibr recalibration is there. But there's also a recalibration in the context of um, yourself as a developer, you know, in the sense that you, you want to put your resources where you have your maximum returns. So um, for me, making sales, is it better for me to put in where you have the higher demand? Of course, yes. So I've had to have a, a paradigm shift in, in that regard as well. But, and then in terms of maintenance, Many people in the past were not used to gated estates and so on and so forth. And, and the fact that you can have your three-bedroom apartment in Lekki Phase 1, but it's different from a three-bedroom apartment in Osborne Estate or Ikoi, you know. But you can, you can create an environment in Lekki Phase 1 that is attractive for that market, such that when people look around in Lekki Phase 1, and they come to your development, they can see that there is a differentiation in your product. They will go around, but they will come back to you. And, and so, so necessarily, there is opportunity on both sides, both for the, for the investors and for yourself. Thank you. Thank you very much, yes. And you touched on something um, very important, which, which, is, which leads to my... Um, my next point, and I already mentioned that Priye is a very interesting man because it sits at the confluence of facility management, asset management, and development. We've, 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 we've spoken about value here, you know, from the, from the point of view of the owner of the asset and protecting his cash flow because he, he buys the assets as an investment and he generates this. Something that has let down very many people is facility management such that the, 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 um, the length of life of that asset is not, they don't, it doesn't keep producing at that optimal level for them. So you've, you, you're on the facility management side and you also see from the development side as well. What, what are the gaps you think exist? The things that are not taken into consideration from a developer's, the, the facility management issues that are not taken into consideration from a developer's point of view that ends up hurting them down the line. I mean, you have assets on your books that are 10 years old, some are 15 years old, that you will say, wait a minute, look, if we had thought about this, you know, at the planning stage, we should have done this because chances are that maybe when, when demand is stepping away from your property, if you are taking care of those things, you'll still be able to, you know, hold on to, to your tenants. So what, what are those gaps you've seen? Just wearing, you know, both lenses. Okay. Um, from a facility management point of view, um, it is critical that even at the development stage, um, the facility manager is brought on board. Um, I think this is the new trend. People have caught up on that trend now that um, during the design phase for a project, they now see the need to... Um, bring the facility manager um, in the meetings, in the project meetings. Um, in the past, this wasn't so, and it had a lot of its issues. Um, I'll give you a typical example. Most of the properties we have in the market at the moment, they are 20, 25 years old. Um, at the time of design, um, most of the slabs were, were designed with hollow blocks. And um, the, um, the hollow blocks, then the uh, finish on the slab, they used um, um, parquet, parquet, wooden floors. Um, over time, we did not um, um, realize why they used parquet floors on the, on the slabs. So when there was time for renovation, 
they discarded the parquet floors and used regular tiles. The implication of that is that um, because of the hollow blocks, there is ease of transfer of um, difference in temperature. So the guy on the, on the lower floor leaves his AC on, say, the whole day. The guy on the top floor um, discovers that um, there's water, there's condensation because, because of the difference of um, temperatures. So what, that, what now happens is that the entire building is suffering from I mean, um, condensation issues. Um, and that's a gap in design. Um, if, if, if we had known, we would have done it differently that, okay, maybe we'll use a parquet floor and all that. So design is critical. When you're designing, you should all, always plan that the design is such that um, um, makes facility management easy in terms um, in that it will not cause problems in the future. Most of the properties we have, or most of the buildings in Lagos, we are all aware, key issue is plumbing. M and E is always not, it's always an issue. We've all, most times gotten it wrong, particularly because of the climate where we are and um, um, the m and &E designs have always failed. So it's always a nightmare for, for the facility manager where you have buildings that have plumbing issues. It erodes value. It leads to high vacancy rates because tenants do not want to stay immediately. Um, they start experiencing all that. So it is facility management key and very necessary um, at the design stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a very... And, and it's a very interesting topic, eh? anytime there's a debate around it. And we use that word a lot in this market. And the word is luxury. People will tell you everything here, luxury residential, luxury residential, luxury residential. And we, we don't seem to, I'll give you an example. I have a bit of exposure and experience in the hospitality, right? If it's a five star, it's a five star. Whether you're in Lagos, whether you're in Luanda, whether you're in Shanghai, you say, I want a five-star hotel. They will take you to certain brands, you know, without holding brief for any of them. In the office market where we are right now, we're beginning to see that, you know, convergence as well. People finish their buildings now and hold their hands up and say, okay, you know what, my building is a grade B. In the past, everybody would say, mine was, everything is grade A. Even if you converted a three-bedroom flat to an office, you would say it was grade A. But I think people are beginning to get a sense to, as to the categorization in the office. But the residential is still sort of free for all. Anything you build, luxury, luxury, luxury. Um, yes, you've developed for a long time across the space. And the question, I mean, I want you to give us your view on that. And I'm, I, I'm still struggling to understand if luxury is relative or is actually universal to say this is a definition. So can you, can you just you know, share your views on that? Thank you, Femi. Um, luxury. I know that everybody wants to um, aspire to the highest pedestal in anything, life, love, career and so on. The idea of luxury in terms of residential development, um, casting my mind back, actually started or was driven by the oil and gas industry where Shell had their ROA in Port Harcourt and Worry. They had Freeman House in Lagos and they came up with a spec of what fits in with the, uh, with the demands or the requirements for residential buildings. And this list included certain things that must be in, that must be in the development for it to be uh, acceptable you know, to the oil and gas companies. So you had Chevron, they had their own accommodation as well. So the developers in Lagos now use that script you know, and came up with the, with, the, with the word luxury to describe what they were offering to this echelon of clientele. You know, so people, um, you know, were coming up with um, accommodation or residential developments that had the following. The first 
is about security. That you must have 24 hour security. You must have 24 hour power supply. You know, so the idea that NEPA has come and gone is, is, is not acceptable. But most critically, it should have a swimming pool because they wanted people to be able to relax, you know, and, and have a party, you know, have leisure activities around a swimming pool, and so on and so forth. So you find that when this came onto the market, uh, the, the first estates that were built, you know, for that market were around Ikoi, and, and, and they were charging in dollars. And, and people be, began, the industry just went banana, because, you know, once you finish your your spec and it meets the requirement, it's taken immediately and you're earning dollars. And, and so the luxury market started to bloom. Now, you know that uh, for every market, there is a segment. Every market has a segment. Before we knew it, we started having a segmentation of the luxury market. We started having ultra luxury, uh, super luxury, um, middle luxury, and so on and so forth. And, and over time, um, what has happened is that the market has come to accept luxury as a kind of uh, definition of a standard accommodation that meets certain requirements. Yeah, you know, so that's, that's, uh, that's, that's what luxury is. But to define it now, you would have to dis describe luxury that fits into a, a particular market segment. The market that you're targeting if it meets the needs of that market, then that market is there. You build to it. That's my, that's my experience that's of it. Picture, so yeah. over a long period of time. Over a long period. Thank you very much. Because I, I, I'll, I'll scratch my head sometimes and I'll say, look, so if I have the fine marble and I had all this, but the moment I stepped out of my gate, it was into potholes, you had a bachelor next door, you had a water pushing truck. I, I mean, how does that impact my, my luxury my luxury experience. So, um, Charles, it seems going from what GS has said, we've, we've not we've not laid this this debate to rest. What's what's give us your view on this on this on this luxury issue? <laughs> Thank you. Luxury market is still there. Uh, just let me take it from the rev, <clears throat> from how you started. The, 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 when you step out of your house and you got onto the road and you find portals and all that, you see, that can be dealt with. That's outside your purview. That's a government issue. And uh, except you want to deal with it from a CSR point of view. But <laughs> in the apartment itself, the present day definition or description of what luxury apartment should be. We're looking at the what's the location of the property. That's one. We're looking at the who is the occupant or who is going to be the occupant of that property. There is a particular uh, 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 segment of the society that we are looking at. And we quite understand that I agree that luxury is stratified. The luxury apartments are stratified. We have different classes of luxury apartments. But if we are looking at the highest uh, uh, level, if you like, call it super luxury, Right? It must equally have adequate amenities, amenities that are properly defined aside from the facilities within the premises, the generators, the swimming pools, the, the, the lifts and all that, if they have lifts, right? The amenities within the apartment. They could be, uh, the apartment may be um, uh, uh, intelligent building such that if I put my hand under the tap, the water comes out without my touching anything, or I get into the room and the lights come on. So these are some of the things that can define the present day luxury. But to say that it does not exist, it still it does exist. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like um, the infusion of technology that you mentioned. And I'm going to um, give Pre a sort of a trick question. There was a research done by, actually the research partner for this event, Estate Intel. And they were trying to find out which feature in luxury residential commanded the highest premium. So I'm going to read a few things to you, and I hope you get the right one. So he says, members only club, designed by a renowned architect, advanced gadget and technology, 
sustainable sustainable um, features. Everybody's about green and sustainability. Luxury finishes, larger apartment sizes, luxury amenities, and quality facilities management. One of these features, people were prepared to pay 50, a 15% premium for. Which do you think it was? Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I know, based on my um, he's, experience he's, he's in the market... He's qualifying his answer. He just wants to leave the background. Okay. That most premium clients would um, pay premium for mm. quality facility management. Okay, that's absolutely correct. So the research showed that people were willing to pay at least 15% 15, 15 premium for quality facility management. So it, even, I mean, that speaks to the fact that in our context of luxury and everything, it looks like it really starts from people getting quality facility management. How, how important is that to the luxury experience? Okay. Um, because from all that has been said, yes, um, for it to be luxury, the, the location has to be right in the first place, or you create um, the right environment within it. So if it's, uh, as you say, you step out of, the, of your luxury apartment, you go into a pothole, or you make sure that within um, the environment itself, you create that luxurious um, um, environment so, um, so that um, your residents um, can actually feel different. Because look, the infrastructure in Lagos, um, we all know most of the time is beyond what the um, developer can, um, yeah, is beyond his control um, to a large extent. Okay, um, facility management in itself. Right now, we, um, from the way we do it within our own firm, we, we have even gone beyond catering to just the external facade and the amenities. We even bring the facility management into the apartment. Okay, uh, because most times they'll tell you um, all, everything pertaining to the internal apartment is, um, is on the tenant's responsibility. But what we realize is, look, people that are paying you premium, they don't want to get bothered with um, a, a, a doorknob in, in the apartment is broken, then they start looking for a technician. The wall is dirty, they start looking for a painter. They want facility management that is responsive, that you, know, you call at, at the dial, you know, um, whatever issues they have, even within the apartment that has been taken care of. And um, we see them willing to um, pay a premium for, for that sort of, sort of service. So facility management can never um, be overemphasized in luxury. In, in the luxury thing. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's um, some things we've established and it's clear is that there's this trend towards um, smaller units. Investors should not be shy or, I mean, should not shy away from it because the cash flow from smaller units is very strong. The demand is high. You will, you will minimize the voids in the smaller apartments, hence, you know, sustaining your investment better. And clearly, there is a, 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 a big market. And I think, I dare say, they're pushing the envelope when it comes to luxury because now that the, you have more people who are demanding higher standards. So apart from the word people pushed around, this was luxury, that was luxury. People are going for that experience, almost shy of saying they're living in hotel branded residences. They want that level of, of service. All right, let's leave it there. It's very interesting what you say about luxury. I think in Nigeria, we just like to put names to things just so that they can sound better than they really are. And it, it, you know, it, it really is true because when you look at uh, commercial buildings, you know, we grade them into what grade A, grade B, and all that. And but then, somehow, with um, residential, you know, we don't seem to do that. We just call every single thing in Nigeria luxury. But thank you very much. A round of applause for the moderator and the panelists for this insightful conversation on the changing face of the residential scene. You can come down. Thank you. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, once again. I think this was actually a very interesting panel, and I think those who missed it, they really have missed something. Because we talked commercial, yeah? And um, people went home and didn't wait until we were... Oh, thank you.
until we had this conversation for residential. But ladies and gentlemen, I mean, what can I say? We have come to the end of day one of the West Africa uh, Property Investment Summit and Exhibition. Now, it's been an, an amazing couple of hours and a lot has been discussed, but there is a lot more to come. Tomorrow, we're gonna to be having more discussions around um, hospitality, so the um, hotel market, the retail space, we'll touch on that. We'll look at uh, prop tech again. We will um, touch on the uh, facilities management space. There was a discussion just now, um, and you know, there was a question asked about uh, facilities management. So we're going to be looking at the changing face of facilities management tomorrow. And that's not all. We have quite a few things. In the morning at 9 a.m. we'll be having a presentation by our international guest speaker, Yamini Virani, founder, Celebrus Business Strategies from the USA. We go to work every day in the real estate space and the aim is to make money in real estate. So she will tell us how to ensure that sales continue in real estate, even when the economy is down, which is something that happened to us here in Nigeria. So she wants to make sure that we continue to make money. So this is, this is one that you can't really miss. As I mentioned, we'll talk about funding, the retail space, hotels, land, and property valuation as well. We will be here from 8 a.m. for registrations and um, breakfast as well, but we will start 9 a.m. sharp. Now remember, ladies and gentlemen, there is a one hour networking or 30 minutes networking session or so, so you can go outside, you can meet your um, industry colleagues, swap cards, but for those of you who registered for dinner, there's dinner at the Sky Restaurant today at 6.30, so we urge you to make your way up from 6 o'clock so that um, you know, dinner can start. It's a very well organized um, dinner that's been put together um, courtesy of a Zama, so dinner is sponsored by Zama. So please make your way up to the Sky restaurant once you're done with networking. Please remember to bring back your delegate tags and lanyards for entry tomorrow. Where's mine, it's there. But please remember to bring those tags. Now, if you look at those tags, by the way, if you're not sure if you registered for dinner, if you look at those tags, there's a fork and knife sign if you registered. Now, we have run out of spaces for dinner, so if you didn't RSVP, unfortunately you won't be able to join us for dinner tonight. So it's not that we don't appreciate you, we do appreciate you, but you didn't register. Um, what else? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for your time and your contribution in making day one of this summit a success. We hope to see you tomorrow. Special thanks to our sponsor, our platinum sponsor, Broad Property Group. Um, silver sponsor OPIC and NMRC, our dinner sponsor Zama, lunch sponsor Urban Shelter, Development Innovation Forum sponsors, that was the forum that went on in the other room, IFC Edge, and the industry sponsors, they were all here, all the names are listed up here. Uh, yes, so that is it. Thank you ladies and gentlemen and see you tomorrow 9 a.m. Remember we will be continuing the conversation, so we hope that you'll be here early. Thank you very much and a safe trip home. By the way, there's still a session going on in room number two, the focus on Ghana. So that session hasn't ended. So we actually urge you to make your way so you don't miss out on what's going on in Ghana. Make your way to room number two, which is just outside. You come out of the building, you cross over, there's a door, you just walk straight in. Um, they're talking about Ghana's retail space, Ghana's residential, commercial space. So if you're an investor, if you're a developer, you wanna find out about the opportunities in Ghana, this is the time to go and get that sorted. So make your way please to that room if you want to or you can make your way out to network or you can make your way up to, to uh, dinner if you registered. Thank you. Don't forget to take all your belongings. I can see one of the uh, security men, Echo Hotel uh, security standing out here and you know he, he came to me early and said some of you had left your 
phones and your bags and your laptops behind. Please don't do that. We don't want anything to go missing. So please check that you have all your belongings because this room will possibly be cleared or it might be moved around so we may not be able to find your items if you leave them behind. So please take your belongings with you. Thank you.